we get started, I'll thank you again for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Jay Abraham. Uh, I'm with the Mantle Works. I support uh, the verification and validation products uh, here. Uh, apologize for not being able to, to make it out there in person. Uh, so my talk, talk is about uh, the use of model-based design, and, and in particular to, to help uh, with uh, some of the verification and testing activities. And I think, you know, if you look at your typical software development process, uh, you'll, you'll find that um, there are four main phases. There's the requirements phase, there's design, there's coding, integration. So in requirements, uh, you're developing, iterating, and specifying uh, the requirements. You then will translate that into some type of high-level and low-level implementation of your design itself. Uh, and then that would then in turn get converted to code either using automatic code generators or you might, uh, you might uh, decide to uh, write that code by hand. And then the, the code for that software component gets compiled and gets integrated with uh, the rest of the system and then you start commencing system level tests. Now there have been lots of uh, papers and analysis in terms of uh, errors that can be detected uh, using this type of a development process. Uh, you know, the development process could be a V model, agile, whatever, but typically, you know, as you look at the errors that are detected across these phases, you are going to be able to, to, to find and isolate uh, defects uh, this particular study was done by the Software Engineering Institute of uh, Carnegie Mellon, and, and they found that uh, you know, you're going to find a certain number of errors in the requirements phase. It then ramps up as you get to design. You then find some more errors in coding, and then even as you get to testing, you'll, you'll still find some, some additional errors. The, the takeaways here are that you know, errors are typically found late in the development process. Right? Ideally, you want to be able to find everything in, requirement, in, the, in the requirement phase, but that's not necessarily the case. And then the other takeaway is that even, even though you're finding these defects using this type of a development process, you may still have some latent errors uh, that may remain in the software. So um, you know, how, do we, how do we try to address these two, two factors? Uh, finding errors late and also uh, making sure that, that there aren't any latent uh, errors that, that remain in the software. So this is where we'll, we'll look at a model-based design as a potential methodology uh, to consider to, to, to help with uh, some of these, these pain points. And, and model-based design follows the, you know, this traditional uh, development process requirements through integration. But one of the, the fundamental bedrock um, foundations for model-based design uh, is the ability to do continuous verification and validation. And what this means is that as you are uh, in each of these different phases, or as you are getting ready to go from one phase to another, you can do some very quick iterations uh, to ensure that uh, you're trying to find as many defects as you can very, very early in the development process. So you know, as you're doing your research and you're writing down your requirements, you then start developing these models uh, that describe your design. And now you get into this very tight loop of being able to simulate uh, your model uh, you're able to, to look for potential problems, uh, check for consist consistency of the requirements, find requirements that may be missing or, uh, or unclear, and thereby uh, you have an opportunity very, very early to try to, to find and isolate these defects. And, and, the, and the, the big benefit here is that you're finding these problems very early on. Uh, you're not even talking about code at this point. Um, all of this is done in simulation. Uh, and you don't necessarily even have to have uh, hardware uh, ready. Now, once you're happy that the design is stable, uh, you can then look at the coding phase, and you can use automatic code generation tools uh, to generate a code direct, directly from those high-level models. Uh, and this code could be software, uh, that is C or C++ code, or it could even be uh, hardware description languages like uh, VHD, VHDL and Verilog. Uh, now, e even when you're in this, in this code generation phase, uh, there's a set of activities that we'll talk about in terms of iterating between design and code uh, to make sure that the design, uh, that the code in, indeed mimics what the, the design uh, that, uh, that you developed. And then once, once you're happy with, the, with that, that code verification phase, you can then get into the integration phase. Uh, once again, there are some, some types of uh, BNB activities that can be performed, uh, and, and I'll go through them uh, in a bit more detail. All right, so let's, let's kind of step back and say, okay, well, you know, you're, you're in the process of uh, developing a design. This particular example you see here is the HL20, uh, which is the uh, personal launch system, uh, which is essentially a space plane that was envisioned in the, back in the 1990s. Um, this is an actually uh, a fully functional um, 
demonstration example that ships with Simulink, uh, which is the MathWorks uh, modeling and simulation environment. And uh, uh, what you see here on the right-hand side is um, the flight simulator that I've hooked it up to. So the, the flight simulator is open source. It's uh, provided by flightgear.org. Uh, you can go ahead and download that, and you can link that uh, directly with Simulink. And if we open up the, um, the, uh, 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 the model that I had there on the left-hand side, you can see now for that, for that particular aircraft, uh, there are various subsystems that are defined uh, graphically. Uh, now, these subsystems um, uh, have to do with uh, the communication systems, the avionics, the FADEX, uh, the, the landing gear control, some of the vehicle dynamics, some of the flight sensors, and so forth. And uh, if we were to dive down deeper, you'll see that uh, you can define this, uh, you can describe this uh, very, uh, graphically using Simulink, and they can be state-based, you can have logic-based um, logic systems, complex math algorithms, and all of these are uh, graphically described. And, and, and the beauty of the, the, the simulation environment is that um, right from within my, my desktop environment, I've got a, a, a video that I recorded here, Right from within my desktop environment, I can go ahead and run this simulation. And that simulation will show you exactly how this aircraft is going to respond uh, to, to various uh, wind gusts and other conditions that I can, I can uh, simulate. So, you know, obviously very powerful because I don't have to wait till I produce code. I don't have to actually have any hardware ready. I can do all of this type of ad hoc testing, what if analysis uh, directly on my desktop. And hopefully I can find, uh, you know, I can start finding issues very early on. I can simulate various uh, fault conditions uh, and, uh, you know, various types of test scenarios to, to make sure that my, my design is performing uh, as it should. Okay, so assuming I've gotten through this phase uh, uh, in, in a decent uh, manner and everything works as expected, uh, you know, the, the spacecraft here is able to make this autonomous landing. Um, uh, yeah, then the question to ask is, you know, are you done? Uh, you know, is this sufficient to, to ensure that we've got a, a, a rather robust certification and validation process? So, you know, those are some of the questions you're going to have to ask at this point. Uh, you know, are you done? Can you generate code from, for this model? Can you go directly to hardware? Uh, and then some of the other questions that may haunt us, uh, you know, could there be other bugs in the design uh, that we may find uh, later? that could have potentially been detected early in the development process. Uh, you know, could there be these hidden bugs lurking in your design? So this is where you need to, to turn to a, a much more process-oriented and a much more rigorous uh, verification and validation methodology. And this is where the MathWorks provides a, a set of VNV tools uh, to help you, uh, you know, develop that rigor and develop that process. Uh, so the, the remainder of this presentation is going to walk you through, uh, you know, how we envision this being done. So, so the first thing you've got to think about is from a requirements perspective, uh, you know, you want to make sure there aren't any requirement errors because, you know, if, if there are requirement issues, uh, you know, that tends to be very, very costly in terms of detecting these very late in the development process. So, for example, if you've got missing or incomplete requirements, uh, you know, the design is not going to meet the customer needs. Uh, if the design lacks sufficient requirements, uh, it's not going to work, work as expected. And uh, if you've got inconsistent requirements, uh, the design may exhibit uh, unintended uh, behavior. So um, I'm going to walk through a couple of the ways in which you can address some of these concerns. Uh, the first is with bi-directional traceability of requirements, uh, and then also making sure that all of the requirements that you've defined in your requirements document maps uh, to the design. So uh, we have a tool called Simulink Simulink uh, Verification and Validation, and what this does is it looks at all of the links that you've established between your requirements document to the design in Simulink, and it ensures that every single design component has an associated requirement. And if, if there isn't, isn't one, it highlights it for you. So in this case, uh, you see that in the state chart, uh, we've got some uh, uh, elements within the state flow chart that do not have any requirements associated with it. So this is, this is a flag to indicate that, well, perhaps that the design doesn't meet requirements. Maybe there was a misunderstanding between the, the implementer of the design and the requirements, and you know it can it can identify places where uh, further investigation is needed. Uh, the next thing that that needs to be also done is to to make sure that the design that you're building, uh, you know, when you start running some simulation tests, 
uh, that those simulations uh, 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 you know, perform as expected. So here what you would want to do is you would want to read the requirements document and then develop test cases and then run those test cases in simulation uh, and then check to see if uh, the simulation behaves uh, as expected. Uh, so we have a variety of uh, ways in which you can do that. Um, we've actually introduced a new tool uh, early this year called Simulate Test uh, that helps you uh, in the, the testing process and, and helps you automate the testing process uh, within Simulink itself. Uh, and here what you can do is you can create your test vectors as time series test vectors. Uh, you could define those in Excel, you could define those in other data formats, and you can bring that data into Simulink and, you, and we provide a test manager in which you can manage all of these test cases uh, to look for pass fail conditions. Uh, we also pro provide traceability so you can actually go from your requirements uh, directly to the test cases to make sure that you've got adequate uh, coverage from a, uh, from a test perspective. So you know, that had to do with time series based test vectors. Oftentimes you, you may have to create these very complex set of test sequences in order to, to validate your design. Uh, and it may not be very easy to develop uh, time series based test vectors because maybe you've got to wait for some time or you may have to look for some type of a condition to arise in order to execute some type of a maneuver. So for example, here we have a requirement that says, you know, in the event of a failure condition at the position sensor or low hydraulic pressure, uh, the fault detection, isolation, or recovery application shall select the primary actuated to isolated mode. So obviously, you're, you're looking for some type of a failure condition to be detected before you expect this application to behave in a certain manner. This can't be described uh, with a time series uh, in a test vector. Uh, so to help with this, we've actually created a new block that we call the test sequence block. And as you can see here, uh, you, we've got a, one of these blocks in front of the component under test that that's uh, sending out these signals to, to test that application. And then you also see we've got that same block that's monitoring the input signals and the output signals, and it's looking for those pass-fail conditions. And if we open these up, you'll see that there's essentially is a, is a, uh, a set of uh, steps here uh, where we're developing a, a, a sequence, a test sequence that we're, we're feeding into the component under test. And then uh, similarly on the, on the receiving end, uh, we're monitoring these signals, looking for that uh, pass-fail condition. Again, this is something new that we introduced uh, earlier this year. Uh, this is part of the, the Simulink uh, test product. Now, um, you know, once you've done this type of functional testing, you, you're happy that the design is behaving as you would expect. Um, the, the other thing you might want to think about is, you know, how do you extend that testing uh, with uh, formal methods? Um, and uh, we provide tools in this realm as well uh, to help you prove that the design meets safety requirements. And uh, one of the nice things here with, uh, with formal methods is that when, when these proof properties are, uh, are not satisfied, we can also generate these counter-example test cases to show you uh, how the design is failing so that you can use that as a way to debug uh, your design. So um, you know, this is done with the Simulink Design Verified tool. Uh, it uses model checking and, uh, uh, and some other techniques. And what you do is you, you model your safety properties uh, graphically. Uh, so here you've got requirements, say, for your thrust reversal system. You, you define these safety properties um, for your, your system itself. You, you then execute this with the Simulink Design Verifier tool with your design under test. And then the tool will tell you uh, whether these conditions uh, have been met or if there's a violation, then uh, a test case is automatically generated. Uh, this is called a counterexample test. And then you can take this test case with those inputs, uh, or run them on your design, see how the design is be behaving, and then use that information to, to take corrective action. OK, so uh, assuming you've gone through this process now of iterating between re your requirements and design, you're happy that your, your design does indeed meet all of the functional requirements, you now get into the implementation phase uh, of your design. Uh, at this point, you may be making changes, like for example, you might be going from a floating point implementation to a fixed point implementation or making other tweaks uh, to the design itself. And, and at this point, you need to be concerned about implementation errors. Uh, so implementation errors refers to things like having dead logic or unreachable states. Uh, you may uh, have overflow issues, uh, divide by zero, or other mathematical issues. And obviously, if you have these type of uh, uh, you know, errors in your design, there can be some very severe consequences. Uh, you could have incorrect operation when the design is subjected to abnormal inputs. 
uh, or maybe the design could fail catastrophically, uh, indicating that the design is not robust. So um, uh, we can once again turn to formal methods as a way to address some of these things um, using model checking. Uh, we can uh, look for dead logic or unreachable states, and then using abstract interpretation, uh, we can also look for overflow divided by zero out of bound array type, type issues directly in, in, the, in the simulating model itself. So keep in mind, we haven't even gotten to code yet, uh, but we're, we're able to do all of these analysis very, very early still on that simulation uh, model. Uh, and now this is done with the Simulink Design Verifier tool. Uh, here's a screenshot showing you how it actually identifies dead logic. So here's a state flow chart, and what the tool is doing is it's showing you that these branches that are identified in red uh, actually never execute. So there's no set of inputs that would ever activate those branches, uh, and obviously that, that, that indicates a, a misunderstanding between the requirements of the design or, or, the, or, the, or the design itself is not implemented correctly. And then using abstract interpretation, we can also look for overflow divide by zero and other design errors. Uh, we use a color coding scheme to identify these type of issues directly in the Simulink model. So here you see a Simulink model uh, with various mathematical operations. There's a PI controller, there's some addition operations, some logic and some other uh, uh, operations being performed. Um, those uh, blocks or those subsystems that are identified in the green color indicate that we've actually proven uh, using abstract interpretation that there will be no overflow conditions. Uh, but then we've also found these other blocks, these addition blocks, where we have actually detected uh, an overflow condition for this design. Now keep in mind, this is using formal methods. We're not running any tests. We're not running any simulations. Uh, we're statically analyzing the design uh, and, and giving you this information. Now when we do find these actual proven overflow uh, or these type of error conditions, uh, we, we can also generate a counterexample test case uh, showing you how uh, this error arises. So you, once again, you can use that information to, to debug and, and fix your design. Okay, now um, once you've gotten through all of this, these, these processes, uh, uh, another thing that you might want to do is to make sure that uh, you have completely tested uh, the design. Uh, and what this really means is you know, taking all of your functional tests, running them in simulation, Examining, the, examining your, your design itself to make sure that all aspects of the design are exercised. So if you've got a state flow chart with various states and branches, ensuring that all of the states are entered, all of the branches are executed, all um, signal paths within your simulating model are exercised. And, and if they have not, then that indication, indicates that your, your design has not been fully tested. So we use the, the term coverage uh, to, to look for uh, parts of the design that are not tested. Uh, that's a term you know, most software developers are very familiar with. Uh, code coverage is something that we often do for safety critical software. That same concept uh, can be applied in the modeling, simulation and modeling domain as well. Uh, and um, using the Simulink verification and validation tool and the Simulink test tool, you can actually look at, uh, you, know, you can run your tests directly in simulation in your model, and then you can identify parts of your model uh, that have been exercised and, and that have not been exercised. So in this case, the, the green indicates those branches uh, that have been exercised in a particular test case. The red indicates branches that have not been exercised. Now, obviously, you would you would do this in a cumulative fashion. You know, you take your you know, maybe 1,500 test cases that you have, run them um, uh, in batch, uh, collect the cumulative data, and then you look at uh, the coverage information. And this could be decision coverage, condition, MCDC table, and, and a few other types of coverage that, that we support. Uh, and you can then establish goals that you want to have 100% coverage or maybe 95% coverage metrics that you can apply uh, to ensure that uh, your design uh, is fully exercised and fully tested. Um, now, uh, in instances where you find that the functional tests uh, do not exhaustively test the design, uh, you can once again turn to uh, formal methods to automatically generate any remaining test cases. Uh, and using the Simulink Design Verifier tool and the Simulink Test tool, uh, you can automatically do that. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind, especially with safety critical software, is that uh, you know these test cases that are automatically generated are random. So obviously, they don't correspond to a functional requirement. Uh, and uh, you know you could do some work to kind of trace these back to some type of a functional requirement or figure out uh, how do you create these functional requirements 
well, how to, how to manually create these test cases to, to mimic these automatically generated tests. But this, is, this, is, this would be a, a, a way in which you can do some automation where if you're not getting 100% coverage, uh, use this capability to generate the remaining test cases, examine these test cases, look at the requirements, see, you know, see what needs to get done uh, to get to that 100% coverage. Okay, so once you've gotten to this part, you know, you're happy that the design is stable, um, the design is, as you, know, you can think of it, has been hardened, it works well in simulation, uh, but you've got to get to code, right? So, um, you know, before you get to code, you may have to do some additional work to make sure that the design complies to standards and things like that. So, so that's, that's one set of checks that you can do. The other thing is once you go to code, you want to make sure that the code and the simulation uh, give you the same results because obviously if the code is producing different behavior than the simulation, now you've got a problem because if you've done all of your VNV on the simulation, uh, you know, you're going to be questioning um, the quality uh, of the code. So you need to be able to do some type of equivalence testing of the simulation results and, and the results that you get from the code. So let's talk about how we do that. But first, uh, just real quick, um, you know, we, we, we can do a variety of uh, standards compliance checks directly in Simulink itself. Um, you know, you can specify your own set of standards, such as, you know, making sure input signals have to specify a min-max value. There's also certification standards out there like ISO 26262 and DO 178C. We've uh, extracted uh, certain aspects of those standards and implemented them you know, within our tools so that you can check your Simulink design model to make sure that it complies to those standards. But then you know, once, once you get past that and you generate the code, uh, you can do software in the loop testing, which is SIL testing, or processor in the loop testing, TIL testing, uh, to make sure that the code uh, is going to behave the same way as your simulation. Uh, software in the loop or SIL testing is essentially uh, compiling the generative code on the host computer or the desktop computer and then running, uh, actually executing that compile code and then looking at the results uh, there to make sure that it matches uh, your, your simulation. Uh, processor in the loop is where you actually cross-compile the code uh, for the embedded target, uh, download the code onto the embedded target, run it on directly on the embedded target itself collect the data there, and then compare that to the, the simulation results. Uh, so uh, the, in terms of the standards checking, um, you know, the, the, the simulating verification and validation tool comes pre-built with all these checks for these various standards. Uh, and then for uh, doing the equivalence check uh, of, of making sure the code is consistent with the simulation, uh, you would use Simulink test. Uh, it's got a, a, a workflow for equivalence testing where it will automatically run your simulation in what we call normal mode simulation uh, with your test vector. It'll take that same test vector, run that on the compile code. Uh, it'll then look at, examine the results uh, on a time step by time step basis, uh, and then it'll tell you whether uh, you know, those two are within uh, the specification that you provide. Okay, so once you get past all of this, you know, you're happy that the code is uh, functionally correct, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, you've generated code for uh, one software component. <laughs> that software component is gonna get integrated with some other code. Uh, you know, that other code could be handwritten code, it could be some other generated code, uh, but it's essentially now you've gotta be concerned about the interfaces. Uh, and uh, now you've got this deployed code that, you know, essentially consists of a, a mix of different types of code. Uh, and at this point, you, you need to be concerned about runtime errors, such as non-initialized variables, bad pointers, and, and the like. So this is where you can turn to, um, you know, formal methods again, uh, in particular uh, using abstract interpretation-based static analysis uh, to check the runtime behavior of the code. Uh, so this, all of this can be done actually without running any test cases. Um, it's not, it's done statically. Uh, and, and because it's formal methods, it's because it's abstract interpretation, uh, you can prove um, that the software is free of uh, critical bugs like overflows, divide by zeros, bad pointers, uh, making sure array indices are within bounds and so forth. And if, if there are bugs, um, you know, you can actually find that uh, in this phase itself. Um, so, um, you know, there was an earlier talk talking a little bit about abstract interpretation, but you know, uh, to kind of add to that, it's a very powerful technique. Uh, it, it, you can apply that directly on source code uh, with the MathWorks tools. We support uh, C, C++, uh, and the Ada language. Uh, you can uh, prove that mathematical operations like you know, C equals A plus B will never overflow. 
Uh, you can check to make sure that array indices are within bounds, make sure that the pointers are within bounds as well. And then you can also have very complicated mathematical uh, operations, uh, either you know, integer math or floating point math, uh, making sure those, uh, those operations don't uh, you know, have divide by zeros or overflow type, type conditions. And there's a whole host of other checks that we can also do. Um, this is now with the polyspace products. Uh, when the analysis is done on the source code, uh, we actually identify uh, those parts of the code that are proven safe. Uh, we color that in green. Uh, if we detect a runtime error, that is colored in red. Uh, we can also detect dead code at this point as well, so that's colored in gray. Uh, if we're not, not able to prove that the code is safe, uh, that's colored in orange. Uh, and that could be indicating that the code may fail under some condition. Uh, now, for C, C++ code, we can also check for coding rule standards such as uh, MISRA and JSF. Okay, so, you know, given all of that, uh, you know, in the, in the half hour span here, so you've kind of seen how, um, you know, the, the, the various different V&V activities that can be applied, you know, using model-based design, you know, starting all the way from requirements, confirming that the requirements map to design. Uh, once you get to the design itself uh, that, that's drafted in Simulink, you can run, execu you can execute functional tests, uh, you can perform formal verification, you can also automatically generate tests, uh, then you can get to code. Uh, once you get the code, you can make sure that the code and the, and the simulation model are, are equivalent uh, and, and consistent. And then once, you, um, once you're also looking at integrating that code, uh, you know, performing robustness checks of that integrated code with static analysis. Now, one topic I did not cover was hardware in the loop, um, which is, you know, another way to do rapid prototyping. Uh, but that MathWorks also has some additional tools, um, you know, to support hardware in the loop uh, testing as well. So I guess with that, um, I can take any questions that uh, you might have. Are there questions? Hold on, just a moment. Um, has these techniques been applied to some of the larger programs at NASA at the time? Uh, yes, so I think, you know, the, the polyspace, for example, has definitely been applied. I think there was a talk earlier today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I was not able to join by WebEx, I was not able to see. Um, and then some of these other tools uh, are being used by NASA, yes. I think, uh, is, I think polyspace is in place at JPL. Yeah, it is. It, it, things are in place, and that doesn't necessarily mean no, no, they're they employed. No, no, okay. They, they, Yeah, actually, one more thing to add. I think uh, we also have something on our website about NASA Ames where they talk about the use of uh, simulated verification validation to do requirements linking and also to do some of the model uh, style, style checks as well as, uh, you know, using polyspace for, um, you know, proving the code, which is the LADI program, which I believe Matt was referring to. Okay. Yes, we use both um, uh, verify models and also Other questions? Okay, thank you for